it, this wouldn't have happened without Paul Caton. It wouldn't have happened without the Salmon Drift Creek Watershed Council, and I'll get into some of the partners, but um, Paul, he, he's so humble, and he just undertells his story all the time. And um, so I'm going to try to incorporate him throughout the talk today because he deserves it. So he was the president of the Watershed Council. I met him in 2001 when I started as a hydrologist on the Hebo District. Um, he says he was just this volunteer. He did. He was the backbone of that Watershed Council. So again, underselling. But this talk is a bit of a transformation of a talk that I was really blessed and fortunate to give in Spain. Um, I submitted an abstract to describe this estuary work to a climate change conference, and I thought I would just be sending a poster. And they said, no, you need to come and you need to talk at our conference. So I took my 18-year-old um, daughter and we traveled across Spain and worked our way to San Sebastian where we got to give uh, a version of this talk. I, I couldn't, um, I did it on my own dime and I didn't, I wasn't representing the Forest Service, but um, it, it's a, an amazing place and I, I just can't wait to tell you about it. Oops. I have to get out of that. And your little mouse is, okay. All right. So the first message that I love to give is that it can be done. Uh, people look at places like this and they think, oh, you know, never in my lifetime or, oh, it'll take way too long. Um, but this work, based on the protections that were in place and that accumulated over time because they just seem to kind of um, manifest themselves, it started with the Cascade Head Scenic Research Management Act, the Experimental Forest, um, Marine Reserve now, the Preserve on the Headland, which is the Nature Conservancy Preserve, um, and, and, and then some. But with those protections in place, the partnerships began. And really through partnership, one of the, the most important protection was created, and that's the Cascade Head Scenic Research Management Act. It was a small grassroots effort, handful of landowners in the Cascade Head and the Salmon River Estuary in Otis, primarily, went to Congress and they said, look, we don't want this headland to look like every other headland. And we don't want this estuary to look like every other estuary up and down the, the coastline. We want to stop the development and we want to move forward in a different way and think about this place differently under a, you know, a, a conservation uh, theme. With that, the, the restoration began. It started actually in 78, 87, 96, oh, and, and on and on. I'll, I'll get into that too. So the persistence and the fact that the Saisla National Forest was appointed by this act that passed Congress, which put in place a management plan that then designated this area as a, a place that we could uh, learn from and do the restoration actions and then follow the change through time and try to understand it and quantify it and, and build from that. I keep wanting to hit the. So here are these protections I talked about. The experimental forest was established in 1938. We have the longest standing record of um, Sitka spruce hemlock forest. There's the Nesco and Crest Research Natural Area on the headland, which has been collecting data in the Sitka spruce forest within the fog belt of the Oregon coast since 1936. The Nature Conservancy's Cascade Head Preserve is about 160 acres. The Cascade Head Scenic Research Management Act that I've been talking about, that's about 9,000 acres and it includes the headland and the estuary. Um, the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve was a designation that was kind of considered by Congress of the United States as a land grab back in 1976. And so Biosphere reserves really haven't meant very much in the U.S. They were really controversial, and they stayed controversial for maybe maybe they, they still are. Um, but we were able to keep the biosphere reserve designation here because we felt like it really fit this place very well. And we can grow from that, and we can partner internationally because of it. The marine reserve in 2012 is just off three rocks here. It's off the, the mouth of the, of the river. This is a nice summary that I gave in Spain because people don't like to think that it's over 40 years uh, of effort that this, this work takes. But if you boil it down to just the essential parts, the work itself took about five years. 
87 essential partners, and I'm including the research folks because they're helping us tell the story, they help us get additional funding, so they really are partners in this as well. And then the end result is 1,800 acres of tidal marsh restored. Here are the sites that I mentioned. So you can see each year is the designated, that is when we restored those tidal marshes. Um, the, the photo itself is a 1975 oblique photo. So this is um, pixie land in the foreground here at 2010 and 11 was already bankrupt. Um, what else do I wanna tell you here? The reference marsh, the reference tidal marsh was never diked or gated. So um, that was our, kind of keystone through the restoration efforts so that we could understand what the natural processes would have been doing to these tidal marshes and these tidal channels all these years that these other sites were diked and cut off from the tide. So you can see that, like I said, the work started in 78 and kind of marching through those low estuaries um, through 96. And then we were able to, with Paul Caton's help again, and the work that the student charrette put together in 2006, we were able to secure another $1.4 million worth of work to go on with the effort, form a student charrette group that met with the community locally and identified the remaining restoration elements that needed to be completed here. And first priority number one out of that student charrette process with um, buy-in from the local community because they were meeting with them weekly over that six week internship was Pixie Land. The second one, and that's 2010 and 11, that whole area is about 55 acres of what was an amusement park that ran for about four years. The suspicion from what I understand is that the, the, um, the rain, <laughs> the, uh, the difficult season of operation um, in the coast was, was really its downfall. It had standing water and flooding in, t in the interior it's got a dike that goes all the way around it. They created these kind of unnatural water features um, and just, it became essentially a, you know, kind of a, a, a sponge of the local environment. And so that equipment, the um, amusement park rides and everything were within salt spray. I mean, the maintenance and the upkeep on a place like that would be, would be quite difficult. So it ran for about four years. Priority number two was the 2008 and 2009 housing development. It was um, called Tamar Keys. So I wasn't involved in the early restoration, but we learned a lot from that 78, 87, and 96 marsh. Uh, when I came into the watershed program manager position for the Sayisla National Forest, the student charrette was just wrapping up and I was basically handed uh, a grant agreement and wrote it with uh, Ken Beerley's help from, uh, he's retired from Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. And by that January, we had uh, $1.4 million to spend. Of US Fish and Wildlife Service money, Department of State Land funds, Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board funds, and Paul Caton was my right hand. So this is Pixie Land. When it was in operation, this is Main Street Pixie Land. It was actually dedicated by Tom McCall in 1969, and again, it ran from 1968 to 1974, but I still run into people who remember and went to Pixie Land, maybe some of you, and my, uh, when Paul Caton and I were working on this project, Catherine Pruitt was the executive director of the Salmon Drift Creek Watershed Council, and she gave this wonderful presentation to a, a whole room full of um, district rangers from the Forest Service, and she showed a slide of her standing on the dock of the log flume ride, screaming because she couldn't go on the ride, she was too little. And her brothers and sisters were all on the ride and her mom took this picture of her and she, her fists are down on her side and she's screaming. And she, she said to the Forest Service folks that now I get my revenge. <laughs> and we were just starting to do the Pixie Land restoration project. And um, yeah, she, she told it so well. So partnership and education, I've gotten to work with some of the best people on this project. Um, Graham Clegg is right here throwing the seed. He's throwing um, tufted hair grass seed here. Those two people next to us are um, Pat Mangan with the National uh, Park Service. He helped us get the Biosphere Reserve designation for 
um, the future. Um, there's no sunset to that, I guess, since we were able to push that through UNESCO and get that approved. Um, this group going across the headland is a, a group of students that have, they've come out with me pretty much every year in the fall. Um, they're a group from a small charter school in the valley. And then that voting group is a group that's out with Graham Clegg from um, Westwind, I believe. So here's just some of the work to restore the natural processes. There was so much that had gone on in the later um, versions of this restoration. You know, the early projects were just dike removal and tie gate removal. The later projects, there was infrastructure. There was there were often no ad builds. We had really not a whole lot to go from. I, I remember um, being out in these sites and just trying to navigate from old photos and trying to unmask the infrastructure and figure out what we were dealing with. And in some cases, like at Tamar Keys, they didn't build ditches to lay the conduit. They just laid the conduit on the marsh grass and then put four foot of fill over the top of it and put the housing pads there and built right up next to the water. And they had a tie gate at the outlet of this stream and they had a tie gate at the top of the stream and they had an overflow ditch around the outside. And so they would just regulate the amount of fresh water that would come in and go out and they had a little lake that they maintained the elevation of. So it was a really interesting um, kind of archeological uh, <laughs> process. Here's some aerial footage that we got of, you can see the, the um, let's see, how do I wanna describe? The area outside of the dike on the photo on the right is reference marsh again. It's, it's, it's kind of the guiding, light of all the work we were able to do out here because we were able to stand on that dike, for instance, and we could, we could even point to some of our granting agencies and we could say, that area is what we want this interior area to look like when we get all done. And because that was there and it was reference condition, it was full of tufted hair grass and the kind of vegetation species that would just be carried into the area on the tides. So we didn't have to do an extensive management plan for the vegetation. Um, necessarily. I mean, anytime you start to go up out of the, the edge of those systems, then you're dealing with fresh water and you're invasive grab a hold. Another partner in all of this is the salmon recovery story and Kim Jones and Dan Bottoms work to understand these systems, to sane the low marshes, to revisit time and time again once we had removed the dikes and the tie gates. And they followed every one of these projects from the very beginning. So um, Dan Bottom has this great series of questions that he has raised over the years. And it's, if, if we build it, will they come? And if they come, will they be glad they did? Referring to the young ring salmon. So this is such a great story because they don't delay. Come in immediately. And we've waited. We've stood there with the crews of people helping us do this work. Uh, Paul and I, you know, side by side, watching that first tide come back to these places for the first time in 38 years. And, you know, jack salmon rolls right where the tide gate was. And they come in on that first tide and the young rearing fish grow at about, you know, 0.78 millimeters a day. So the life history pattern, um, the way that they're using these sites is, is different than what folks thought. They're starting to study it more and more and learn from it. And it's, it's just, it's a fascinating, uh, part of the story. This photo again, just because I, again, I want to point out what these places look like. The the upper photo is at Tamar Keys. That's the, it was a trailer park. It was built very similarly to, to Pixie Land in that it had a dike all the way around. It had an overflow channel around the outside and it had tie gates that controlled the freshwater inflow and um, prevented the tide from coming in. A typical estuary without a development on it will just receive the tides, will receive the flood flow. It'll be a, a very essential mixing ground of salinity gradients for young ring fish to transition from freshwater to the ocean. But when we when we get involved and we find this nice flat ground, we think, oh, that's perfect for other things. So we start to, this is a cross section of a tidal marsh with your typical tidal channel. And your tidal flow will flood the channel first and then flood out onto its associated marshland. 
that there, the dotted line is the extreme high tides. When European settlement occurred, these areas were used for cattle grazing and, um, you know, houses close by. Of course, that doesn't work when the tide is pushing your cattle out. So what happens is we start to see these um, earthen levees constructed. Well, that doesn't let the fresh water out from the interior sides. So they put these tide gates in, culverts, with a flap on the outlet. And so in this picture, it prevents the tide from coming up into it. In this picture, you can see that the fresh water is able to pass. But what occurs relatively quickly is that the ground behind the dike subsides. And that happens for a number of reasons. The organic material, it's their peat marshes, their layers, they're a layer cake of grasses and, and um, decayed grasses and sediment accretion on these tidal systems and freshwater deposits from uh, the freshwater systems. Um, that organic layer starts to oxidize and, and dry, and that results in the soil topping. When that occurs, you start to collect groundwater on the interior of these dikes. And essentially the very thing that you built to try to help you use the land the way that you wanted is now preventing you from using the land at all. So in the marsh work that we did in the Salmon River Estuary in our, in our restoration projects, we just removed the dike. Regardless of the elevation of the marsh, we just removed the dike and let the tides come back. In some restorations, and even in Tamara Keys and Pixie Land, we thought we may have to add some soil. We thought we may have a discrepancy in what that marsh elevation should be based on our reference marsh elevations that we were measuring. Um, but the reality was we didn't. We're there with laser le levels and we're ready to kind of manipulate what we have to, to deal with. And the marsh grass existed underneath that fill, was intact, and seemed like it was just ready to grow. So together, diking and vegetation conversion has resulted in the loss of 95% of historical tidal forested wetlands, almost 96% of historical scrub shrub tidal wetlands, and about 60% of historical tidal marsh. Oh, this is what happens when you convert from Google Slides to, to see my circles aren't lined up. But the red color and the circles should orient to the years the years that the, the marshes were diked. And that's a, an important part of the story because um, the reference marsh, again, never diked, never gated. They did run horses out there. The Fraser family had um, um, some cattle as well. But they the only thing that they did from a mechanized standpoint is they hayed the high river levee. Um, so that reference marsh has a big green arrow just, just showing you that it's kind of always um, it's always been intact. The 78 marsh was diked the um, least amount of time and had and has the least amount of subsidence that's occurred. The 87 is a close second and the 96 dropped about three feet by the time that dike. I've already mentioned the um, recovery. There's some macroinvertebrate studies that have taken place out here as well, just looking at the diet of the young ring fish. Um, and again, the, the faster growth rates have been documented. What occurs when an area subsides to the extent of the 96 marsh is it, it will do some salt panning for a time. So the tides will come out onto that marsh more frequently because it's sitting at a lower elevation. Um, the water will evaporate and then the salts remain and prevent some of the natural vegetation recovery. So um, there's just some interesting things that we're learning about the, the phases of, of work out here. This is a slide by Rebecca Flitcroft, Becky Flitcroft in PNW Research Station. And it's a LIDAR image looking at those elevations and it very, very visually describes the, um, the subsidence. So the pink, really dark kind of pink colored marsh, that's the reference marsh that was never diked or tide gated sitting at about, um, sitting at that kind of elevation that this whole area would be if it had not been diked. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears, but there's a reason for it. So the um, the other impacts that we've had besides, you know, just really altering our, our valley bottoms and our um, 
stream channels and our estuaries is in these stream channels, we've had splash dams. All of these little brown um, lines on this map are splash dams and log drives that occurred for over 70 years in Western Oregon. This has um, a significant impact on the stream geomorphology and on the resilience of these systems going forward in a time of change. So obviously um, tidal estuaries play a, a very significant role in absorbing flood flows. Um, streams, when they're devoid of the geomorphology and the connectivity to the floodplains, um, don't do as good a job of absorbing <laughs> flood flows and they transport that um, high velocities of, of flow downstream which is why people use them as roads before we used roads. They built these dams across them, they've accumulated the logs behind them, and then they would either blow up the splash dams or they would open the sluice gates and you would have a, a high velocity and a high volume of water carrying logs all the way down to the mills that were constructed on the estuaries using similar practice to what I described about the Salmon River. And then this is what you have left. This, publication that I got this from is from uh, Miller in 2010, and the title of it is A Stream Remembers. And our streams remember. The, these, this, this system here in that top photo is scoured completely to bedrock all the way down to the mill. So at whatever location they would have been using these splash dams, the impacts went on for miles. Another uh, heavy um, impact that we're still uh, dealing with and definitely impacts the resilience of these systems going forward is the U.S. Swamp Land Act of 1850, which were essentially paid people to drain their streams to facilitate agriculture practices. And of course, a straightened stream definitely facilitates whether you're grazing or um, uh, planting a, an agricultural crop. The photo here on the right is of um, an improved stream channel that was paid to improve by the U.S. Swamp Land Act, and it's in the red band. And what we're trying to do for the most part now is restore to what's in the upper part of that picture, um, fully uh, exhibited you know, natural processes of a stream channel that hits a, a low gradient valley where it's gonna be carrying different sediments. Often they'd be It'd be comprised of really shallow channels and they'd be very connected to the plane and they would readily recharge the water table as well. Why is that important? Well, because our conditions are changing. Um, these are photos from this area. Um, I used to live in Nesquan. This photo at the top here is in 2021 in November and that's a flood flow of proposal rock where Hot Creek, um, I'm sorry, where Nesquan Creek comes out toward Proposal Rock. And so my point with all of the, the back um, history here is, is, are we resilient? Are these systems resilient? Are we doing everything that we can be doing to prepare for what's coming or what might already be here? The lower photo is just, it just, I've just never seen anything like it on the coast where, you know, when I lived over here and I'm working for the Forest Service for as long as I have, um, you know, the Sayusla just doesn't burn. So for the Echo Mountain fire to occur like it did and for me to have so many close friends personally that were um, impacted and it, it's, I'm, I'm really thinking about it. So I'm, I'm thinking more about droughts and drying of the vegetation at the coast. I'm thinking more about what that results in in terms of fire regimes. And certainly with more water, I'm thinking about where the water is gonna go. This is also in Nesquen. This is right at the bridge to go into South Beach. Um, I noticed this little house is for sale, actually. Um, but, uh, this was uh, November 13, 2021. And again, it's kind of a question of location, location, location. Um, where are our roads and infrastructure positioned on the landscape? Often on the flat ground, right at the toe of a slope, perhaps even on an alluvial fan. Something to think about. Um, where do tidal surge and peak floods collide? Right where we live, right here. You know, this is where the sea level rise and more intense flood flows are going to collide. 
And then where is the critical habitat for salmon? There's some migration um, zone mapping right now, looking at the salinity gradients and where things might shift to and what's there in terms of salmon habitat and, and what aren't we thinking about yet that we perhaps should be. So for storage, storage capacity here, for sure, this photo at the bottom is taken at a culvert that didn't used to even be under ODOT's Highway 101. That's at Fraser Creek, where we were able to connect the stream flow from the east side of Highway 101, that used to go through Pixie Land, and come out onto the west side and reunite with its remnant, basically dead end slough that had been like that since 61. So this flow is, you know, it's tidal sheet flow as far as the eye can see out here, all the way to the ocean in certain flood flows. Sea level rise projections. Again, this is a Becky Footcroft LIDAR image with sea level rise. So the light blue is um, just our mean tide. The royal blue, not dark, but the royal blue is with one, with one meter of sea level rise. And then the dark blue that goes us, what's essentially Highway 101 is an earthen dam, um, is a three meter sea level rise. But what's not on this photo is freshwater influences coming from the main Salmon River, flooding out onto the adjacent uh, valley bottom and then colliding with tidal pressure. So in keen tides, if we've had a big flood event, um, you know, it can be quite dramatic to be crossing that uh, Highway 101. And then there's the reference marsh over here with the shoulder of Highway 101 across the reference marsh. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm good. Okay. So um, this is just to show you. It's a Google Earth image. Like I have two of these photos that I really wanted to show and two of those. I don't know why that happened, but you get the gist. There's just water everywhere. And the years are the years that the restoration occurred. And up here, right here, is the fish hatchery. And I've, I've been told by ODFNW folks that used to work at that fish hatchery that once the Pixie Land project was completed on the east side of 101, they didn't have to go out there every bankful flood event to put fish back in the holding ponds that were flushed out by flood flows um, because our, our restoration work was really restoring that flood attenuation. So oh, bottom line here, restored storage capacity, restored tidal channel habitat, um, increased resilience in the face of change. And my end point is to persist. It can be done and it does make a difference. This Duncanberry photo is just a beautiful photograph. But it's a king tide on a gorgeous day without a maybe a, an accompanying flood flow, but all right. So, if we have time. Okay. Oh, sure. Oh, good. Perfect. I did. Paul? Yeah. Oh. Okay, so the a par partial answer in that um, Kim Jones got about three years of funding. I think he was just shy of even three years. He wanted three years. He wanted five years of funding. He, I think he got two. And so he was able to, there are two publications that I know of that came from that work to um, document the recovery of coho moving back in and straying back in once the, what Paul's referring to is that the um, coho were no longer being released uh, from the hatchery program in 2000 and June of 2007, I believe. And then Kim Jones uh, wrote a grant to OWEB and got some funding to look at what happened. If you stop putting the hatchery fish back in, what happens with the native fish? Do they recover? Do they respond? Do they move back in? And 
Um, they did indeed, but he only got to tell a, a short, you know, kind of a portion of that story. There's quite a bit more to be learning from out here. I, I know some of the some of the work that we did uncovered some um, tsunami uh, subsided marshes and resulted in some carbon dating of the grasses and determined that some of the subsidence during a sub subduction zone earthquake was much greater than people thought in some locations. And there seems to be these kind of isolated pockets related to the 1700 quake where the marsh dropped much more than the folks who um, have been studying it for years expected. And there, there's not really an understanding as to, to why. And so there's still quite a bit of coring that goes on and carbon dating out here too. Um, that's just another area where, I mean, I think we just have more work to do and more learning that we could. James? What did I leave? Highway 101. So, okay, the question was, um, what did I leave undone? What did we leave undone? What did Paul and I and the team of people that did all this undone? Um, Highway 101, so when Highway 101 was built in 61, they took Phil off the headland um, coming over from Nesquan because he used to come out at Otis on Scenic 101. It's windy, it's still there. You can come winding around the backside of um, and come out at, at Otis. When they rerouted and straightened it, they came from Nesquin, went over the headland, took the fill, cut through those, those big fills, and then put that material on the marsh and straightened it all across as, as we know now. Um, when the Cascade Head Senior Research Management Act passed Congress, and that grassroots group of folks put together the management plan in 76. They identified that group in 76 said that the most important project was Highway 101, was getting rid of it, rerouting it. I mean, we're, we're talking not very long after it was it was built. So, um, so that's a, it's an interesting story. And it's another thing that we could be learning from that would apply to other places. Because if you think about it, that is just fill material on a peat marsh. If you guys have ever been out at a peat marsh where there's heavy equipment operating, it's like standing on jello. And the idea that that highway is not, it's not constructed to any geotechnical standards. It's, it's really just waste material on a peat marsh. Um, you know, there's, there's some learning to do there. And then highway, and then, and then the, the bridge over the river is, scouring at the footings in both directions because it's grossly undersized for a tidal sheet flow. What's bankful even? What's what's one and a half times bankful? When you have tidal sheet flow and you have tidal pressure squeezing through an undersized bridge and then flood flow squeezing through an undersized bridge, you have scour at both the footings on the east side and the footings on the west side. But that bridge apparently is in better shape than most other bridges in Oregon because that one is not on the list for any work. And then you have Salmon Creek and Fraser Creek that were just dead end channels. They dead ended at Highway 101 when it was built in 61. So you have Salmon Creek on the north side of the river, just dead end ending um, and ditched on the east side to the river, just above the bridge, which is undersized already. And then the same was true of Fraser Creek. So, oh, and the sand spit. I would love to talk about the sand spit because it used to be a sand spit, but with European beach grass, it is stabilized and the shore pine have come in and that has narrowed the river mouth and made a much larger beach on the backside. And if that were regularly overtopping during different ocean conditions, that would also change the salinity gradient and the nature of the estuary. Um, how much? We don't know. How significantly? I don't know. The headland's not going anywhere, but as that sand spit kind of marches toward the headland, the basalt headland, it's it's just an interesting phenomenon. The river mouth has deepened and narrowed. The salt is heavier. It's already a pinched estuary. 
um, which means it's delayed in how it receives the tide and it's delayed in how the tide leaves. And the salt is a wedge that's low. So I don't know if it really interacts with that system the way that it would have um, when that was a sand spit. <laughs> so, and then that's something we can learn from and apply in other places because European beach grass is altering systems up and down, not just this coastline. So that, that's, there's some interesting stuff there. Yeah. Uh, we had a question from uh, Ryan along with Oh, yes, yeah, the beavers moved in immediately to Pixie Land, which was just fantastic because our main criticism. Oh, I'm sorry, the question was if we had any help from beavers. The little furry uh, rodents, the engineers of our systems. Yeah, they came in within the first year to Salmon River to Pixie Land, the amusement park. And the big criticism that we had received, criticism that we'd received from our partners at Pixieland was that we didn't do enough, we didn't build enough of a channel density. And we really couldn't. I mean, Fraser Creek um, was so impacted through the amusement park that, and we had limited funding and we had limited access, um, but the belief of every everybody that we worked with was that there would have been many, many, many sinuous, um, deep, narrow stream channels in that amusement park area. Um, we were only able to unite the headwater flow to the tidal outflow. Um, and, and that took multiple years of work with ODOT just to do that because we had the highway in between. Um, but that very first year, a colony of beavers moved in, um, they put a beaver dam in, in Fraser Creek, kind of a lower check dam. And then that resulted in a whole network of channels forming and additional beaver dams. There's probably seven there now, or it's been a little bit since I've looked, but they're, they've expanded throughout Pixie Land and made that channel network, I mean, far better than we could have, you know, we could have ever done. They were also at Crowley Creek, um, but that family was poached and killed and left on that site. So, and on private land, just, just upstream of Crowley Creek. So I'm trying to do, you know, as much as I can to just educate and inform people about the benefits beavers bring to these systems. And, you know, they work harder than I work at re restoring the natural processes. So I would just like it if we could let them work. That would be good. Yeah, it would have looked, yeah, it, it would have looked a lot like what it looks like across Crowley Creek um, for a ways. There's a tributary that probably would have had a little bit of a marsh associated with it. The Knights Park has a dike that's still there. Um, and there was a dike straight across from the one that's there. They, they, they essentially pinched Crowley Creek into a straight ditch. And we freed Crowley Creek on the, on the south, east side, but there is still, where those trees are growing along the park, that's an elevated, you know, earthen berm. It's, it's smaller scale and, and with the parking and the bathroom and everything there, it probably needs to stay if that infrastructure is going to stay there, so. That word. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Yep. You've had your hand up a couple times. Sorry. Oh, I'll, I'll tell you. 
Okay. Um, the question was, what are we doing about the white PVC pipes that are sticking up out of the marsh um, everywhere? And and I say every time I see one, I tip my hat to Bob Frankel because Dr. Frankel is the one who put the PVC in the ground, secured the probably the very first grant fund for this place, and took some of the early elevation data to understand subsidence and even seasonal subsidence that occurs because these shrink and swell with different um, antecedent soil moisture conditions. So the marshes themselves kind of shrink and swell. And those PVC pipes mark every one of his uh, long-term elevation monitoring sites that helped us tell the story of the subsidence that occurred out here and vegetation recovery because every one of those PVC pipes has a vegetation transect associated with it to look at the vegetation in a repeatable um, fashion through time. Yes, yep, it's it's been picked up. Uh, PNW Research Station and Becky Footcroft, and, and you can reach out to me and I can connect you to the folks collecting that data. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, first question was in there, is there any uh, proposed restoration on Curl Creek? Um, we ran into some hurdles on Curl Creek and I don't know the status. Okay. So we're... Most of the lower curl trees are in the backyard area. Especially when we're, you know, the marshes council is focused on passage bottom way up. Work on upstream supports of barrier cold bottoms. North problem has been a long time. We're just now this month um, working on getting some funding. funding that place upgraded to that other other cold stream. One of them about fire and everything. That's an um, aerial photo taken by Duncan Berry of the Salmon River Estuary. You can see the Cascade Head Pinnacle. That's um, yes, Pacific Ocean. Um, there's no overpass on here. This is all west of one line. That's the sand spit. That's the sand spit that I was talking about that's stabilized with um, European beach grass that's planted. And this is the shore pine that's taken on since the sand, since the sand has been stabilized. When was that? Oh, when did he, the 60s, mid 60s? Okay. Mid 60s, the European beach grass was planted. That's a natural feature. This is. What's 
Huh? It's distorted. That's Highway 101. Which? Yep, it's a king tide photo. I know. Oh, yes, the Celeste River, that's the short answer. Yes, heavily impacted. If you look at that map, um, it would take me a minute to go back to, but, and I actually don't think it comes very far south, that map. So, but yes, there were many tributaries and streams from, that are a part of the Celeste that would have um, been splash dammed and then the log drives would have routed the wood down to mills on the valley floor. <laughs>